Nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world, and then shall the end come. Tell us, when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming, and of the end of the age? Here's today's prophecy update. 4,000 years ago, God made a covenant with Abraham. He promised Abraham that all the land from the river of Egypt in the south to the river Euphrates in the north would belong to Abraham and his descendants after him. This land that God promised to Abraham is known as the promised land today. God's promise to Abraham about this land is presently the number one dispute among nations of the world. The United Nations, the European Union, and many in the United States say that Israel cannot have the land God promised to her. And they are pressuring Israel to divide the land, giving part of it to the Palestinians. The Bible prophesies that conflict over this land will eventually lead to the world's final battle, the Battle of Armageddon. It's obvious that the seeds of the Battle of Armageddon have already been sown. Well, it's so interesting when the President of the United States focuses on this subject at the United Nations and the Prime Minister of Israel and the head of the Palestinians and many others all take time in their precious few minutes that they have to speak to the world at the UN General Assembly, which happens once a year. They just are like a moth drawn to the flame. They can't leave it alone. Well, it continues, and for good reason. God made it the heart of his covenant with mankind that there would be a very special land at a particular place in our world, and he called it the promised land. He entered into covenant. Now, entering into a covenant with God is not like just any other contract. Think of it. A covenant with the God that created the sun, the moon, the stars, the entire universe, and have God look at you and say, I enter into covenant with you this day that that land is yours and your descendants after you forever. Well, it happened 4,000 years ago. However, it's just as strong and just as sure as if it were yesterday. The conflict is ongoing. The arguments rage. The wars are fought over who will possess this area called the promised land. Now the outcome is ensured. However, in the meantime, there's a lot of disputes going on. We're going to talk about it today because President Obama caused quite a furor at the United Nations when he spoke just a week ago today at the UN. He said something about this covenant. He he directly contradicted God. Now that's not a really smart situation to put yourself in, that you would look God in the eye and say, I disagree with you, and I am determined that I am going to change what you said and conform it to my will. That's what happened last Tuesday, or one week ago, at the United Nations. Before I give you the details, I want to mention that I will be in Columbus, Indiana this coming Saturday evening at 6 p.m. And I will be speaking on America's God-given destiny. Every American 
should hear this lesson. If you haven't heard it, make plans to be there. If you have heard it, you may want to hear it again. It's that important. The location will be The Sanctuary, 3939 Central Avenue in Columbus, Indiana. I'll be answering questions like, will the United States of America be part of the one world government of the Antichrist? Will America be a part of the mark of the beast? And will America stand by Israel or will we forsake her in these times just ahead? Those questions I will answer, but I will not give you my opinion. I will answer them straight from the passages of the Bible so all of you will be able to know for sure exactly what the Bible says about these things. Now, that's on Saturday evening at 6 p.m. That's October the 1st, Columbus, Indiana. And then on Sunday noon, I will be speaking on breaking prophetic fulfillments, prophecies that are in progress right now in your news, even today. That's October the 2nd, Sunday afternoon, starting at 12 noon, 12 p.m. And I will be in that session talking about, will the final seven years begin yet this year? And why did the Pope receive the Charlemagne Prize? What's that all about? And what's going to happen with ISIS? What's global terrorism? It was a subject in our presidential debate last evening. Well, I'm going to be elaborating on it from a biblical standpoint point because the present war with terrorism is also prophesied in the Bible. So that's Sunday afternoon. And also on Sunday afternoon, once I spend about 20 or 30 minutes with a prophecy update, I will be opening the floor for questions. You can ask your questions. I will be answering. It's going to be an exciting time. This has become one of the favorite things that we do. So do not miss it. So Saturday evening, 6 p.m., Sunday at noon at 12 p.m. The location's the same, both sessions. Uh, it's at the Sanctuary, 3939 Central Avenue, Columbus, Indiana. I know you're going to enjoy it. Okay, let's talk about this covenant. Let me read to you Genesis 15, 18, where Almighty God made this covenant with Abraham. He had told Abraham, offer sacrifices. Abraham did. He laid the pieces of the sacrifice out. And then all of a sudden, Abraham fell into a trance. And while in this trance, God spoke to him. And here's the account. This is Genesis chapter 15, verse 18. In the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land from the river Euphrates, or the river of Egypt in the south, the great river, and to the river Euphrates way up in the north. So he defined the boundaries of the promised land. There are other passages in the Old Testament that tells us it also includes from the Mediterranean Sea all the over into Jordan. And it gives more explicit detail. But the general outline of the promised land was to be from the river of Egypt in the south all the way to the great river Euphrates up in the north and then from the Mediterranean Sea over into, well, there were two tribes inside of what today is called Jordan. So God outlined the promised land and said, Abraham, this will belong to you and your descendants after you forever. Today, Israel doesn't control all of that land. Israel controlled a very small portion of this land up until 1967, when the surrounding nations, Egypt, Syria, and Jordan, attacked Israel. It was at that time that Israel counterattacked and captured all the land from the city of Jerusalem all the way to the Jordan River. That restored much of the promised land to the people of Israel, but not all. Well, Israel went ahead and annexed the eastern city of Jerusalem, but she has not had the courage to annex the rest of the promised land. Now, the area called the West Bank is biblical Judea and Samaria. It is in the heartland of the promised land. And yet, President Obama, as well as George W. Bush, as well as many others, have said to Israel, you cannot have that land. You've got to take part of that land and turn it into a Palestinian state. Even though it contains Jericho, it contains Bethlehem, 
Uh, it is the area of Judea, Samaria, and yet they insist you can't have your promised land. I know God told you you could have it, but I'm telling you you cannot. That's what's going on right now. Now, what I want to do, uh, there was a, uh, an article written in Israel National News. It's entitled, Presidential Air at the UN. And I want you to listen to this because this is one of the best articles that I've ever read enumerating the real issues involved here. Now, let's make sure everybody understands. We're talking about a 4,000-year-old promise that's the number one source of conflict in our world today. It threatens to throw us into the Battle of Armageddon. As a matter of fact, it ultimately will throw us into the final battle called the Battle of Armageddon. Now, that's at least seven, eight, nine years away. But yet, we can see it shaping up right now. So they're discussing it at the UN. President Obama mentions it in his speech that there needs to be a two-state solution. Let me just read the article to you. The article is entitled Presidential Air at the UN, Israel National News, September 26th of 2016. Despite Barack Obama's speech last week at the UN being endlessly analyzed, there has been no meaningful reference to the way in which the president referred to Judea Samaria. The president remarked parenthetically that Judea and Samaria are Palestinian lands. Only the Zionist Organization of America, the ZOA, has responded and protested the inaccuracy in Obama's words. Obama said, that surely Israelis and Palestinians will be better off if Palestinians reject incitement and recognize the legitimacy of Israel, but Israel recognizes that it cannot permanently occupy and settle Palestinian land. Now, that's the whole crux of this article. He's calling the promised land Palestinian land. Now, this even takes on more somber connotations when you realize the word Palestine and Philistine is the same root word. Look it up for yourself. So he's saying the promised land should be Philistinian land. The article goes on to say the ZOA, the Zionist Organization of America, remarked that use of the term Palestinian land prejudges the issue of sovereignty and borders and is not in accordance with international law, which designates Judea Samaria as unallocated territory without a recognized sovereign. Now think about that for just a moment. So, let's go on. The territory of the West Bank was earmarked for Jewish settlement in 1920 at the San Remo Conference. Now, the San Remo Conference was a conference that was conducted by the League of Nations. World War I had just concluded. President Woodrow Wilson was the driving force behind the League of Nations. So they hold this meeting called the San Remo Conference. And it was there that the territory of the West Bank was earmarked for Jewish settlement because the Jewish people needed a homeland. This was back before Adolf Hitler, if it would have been totally settled by then, perhaps there would have never been a Jewish Holocaust like we saw, but there there was. The article goes on to say, this decision enshrined in the League of Nations mandate for Palestine entrusted to Britain that, short, that shortly followed has never been superseded by an internationally binding agreement. To the contrary, it was reaffirmed by Article 80 of the UN Charter. Okay, now let's make sure we get this because some of this can get to be a little bit tedious here. So let's make sure we get it. This is simply saying that this decision made at the San Remo Conference was later reaffirmed by the League of Nations and then has been reaffirmed by Article 80 of the UN Charter, and that is that the Palestinian territory 
It's called the Palestinian territory because the Romans named it Palestine uh, when the Jews were driven out. They wanted to eradicate the memory of Israel from the land. And so they drove them out and they called it Palestine. And it became known as Palestine from that day to this. Nevertheless, there were no Palestinian people. Well, there were people who called themselves Palestinians. The Jews who lived there called them Palestinians. Uh, the Jerusalem Post used to be called the Palestinian Post. So everybody that lived in the Palestinian territories, they were called Palestinians. Nevertheless, it was agreed by the Balfour Declaration of 1917 that this territory, which was historic Israel, historic promised land, historic Judea Samaria, should become the homeland for the Jewish people. So it was stated by the League of Nations and by the San Remo Conference, which was an international conference that passed this resolution, and it has never been reversed. So it's enshrined in international law that this territory should go to Israel. Now let's continue on. The Arab states rejected the 1947 UN General Assembly partition resolution that called for an Arab and a Jewish state to be established in the territory of the British Mandate. Now let me remind you, after World War II, after the magnitude of the Holocaust had come to light, the United Nations got together on September the 29th of 1947. They said, let's solve this problem once and for all. So they voted to partition the land of the British Mandate, making part of it a Jewish state and part of it an Arab state. Well, the Jews were ecstatic to finally have a homeland of their own that the nations of the world would recognize, and so they gladly accepted. On the other hand, the Arabs who lived there flatly rejected it. We want nothing to do with your partition plan. Instead, we're going to destroy the Israeli nation that you right now are creating. And as soon as Israel declared its independence on May the 14th of 1948, the very, very next day, Jordan, Syria, Egypt, a total of five nations launched a war against Israel. And one of those main nations that launched that war was the nation of Jordan. They come stampeding across the Jordan River to attack the tiny just born nation of Israel, total population at that time was 600,000. So it was 600,000 Jews against 42 million Arabs. Uh, tough odds. Okay, now let's go back and let's make sure we understand. The Arab states rejected the 1947 UN General Assembly Partition Resolution, which was not a binding resolution. It was a resolution by the General Assembly, and if both sides would have accepted it, then yes, it would have been enshrined in international law. But the Arabs flatly rejected it and went to war against the Jewish nation. So, as a result, no agreement on statehood and borders was ever reached. So there's no accepted agreement on statehood, Jordan, which illegally invaded and annexed the territory from 1948 to 1967. Now get that. Jordan came across the Jordan River and declared war on the nation of Israel in 1948. Uh, when the ceasefire was finally reached in 1949, Jordan stayed there. And they stayed there until 1967. In 1967, when the Na the Arab nations surrounding Israel thought they were big enough and bad enough to defeat the Jewish nation. They launched a war. Egypt, Jordan, Syria launched another war against the nation of Israel in 1967. Israel counterattacked and drove Jordan back across the Jordan River and uh, also took much of the Sinai Desert in the south, captured the Golan Heights in the north, from which Syria had been attacking Israel on an ongoing basis. So, now then, Israel occupies the land which Jordan had occupied. So let's, let's summarize. The Ottomans ruled the Palestinian territory for 500 years prior to World War I. When the Ottomans were, were defeated in World War I, the British mandate took control of this particular territory by edict of the United Nations, and then when the Britons pulled out in 1948, 
War was launched against Israel by the Jordanians and other Arab countries, and the Jordanians illegally occupied it. I mean, Jordan had no claims to it. Jordan was on the other side of the Jordan River, but Jordan illegally occupied it in 1948 and held it till 1967. So it's now been occupied in the last 500 years by the Ottomans and then by the British and then by Jordan and now by Israel. It has never been under Palestinian control. We call it Palestinian territories. And this is what this article is protesting, that President Obama called it Palestinian territories. And it's never been controlled by the Palestinians. It's not Palestinian territories. But you keep saying something over and over and over again. You create a lie, especially if it's a big enough lie, over and over and over again. Eventually, people are going to start believing it, especially the way the media harps on things these days. So the Zionist Organization of America added that the Palestinian Authority was founded in 1993, but did not gain control over the areas with Jewish communities, and the Oslo Agreements do not prohibit Israeli residents. Remember the Oslo Agreements were signed in 1993? That agreement does not prohibit Israeli citizens to, from going out there and building houses in those territories. To the contrary, the Oslo Agreements provide for Israeli and Palestinian building in zones under their respective controls. Oslo also lists this as a final status issue to be negotiated by the parties themselves, and Israel is entitled to assert its right for its citizens to live and build in these territories until such time as a peace settlement is reached, which has not arrived yet. Okay, hope that wasn't too tedious for you. But this myth of Palestinian territories that is being propagated by almost the whole world, and especially by President Barack Obama, is simply a fallacy. It is untrue. They just keep saying it and saying it and saying it until finally they will assume the whole world will accept it. It's like saying the earth is flat, the earth is flat, the earth is flat, the earth is flat, until finally the whole world believed it, until someone discovered that it was not flat. Okay, well, that's what we're dealing with here. All right, let me take you one step further, and I will be receiving your calls uh, later on in the program, so you can start dialing now if you choose to. But this article comes from the Jerusalem Post on the 25th of this month, just two days ago. After prepping Trump for the debate, Giuliani says U.S. should abandon the two-state solution. Now, the two-state solution has almost become a sacred cow. They say, oh, that's the only possible solution to the vexing problem between Israel and the Palestinians. However, Giuliani very boldly comes out and says, the United States should abandon the two-state solution. Israel should forget the two-state solution. And here's why, Giuliani says. The United States should give up on a two-state solution between Israel and the Palestinians, former New York Mayor Rudy Giuliani, said on Saturday. You can make peace between the two of them, but you can't treat them the same, said Giuliani, condemning moral equivalence between the two parties. The U.S., he said, should reject the whole notion of a two-state solution in Israel. Why would he say that? Mayor Giuliani saying, we ought to forget this two-state idea that has become so prominent in world news. Then the article goes on to say, Trump's two top Israel aides, Jason Greenblatt and David Friedman, have also advised the candidate to abandon hopes of two states for two peoples living peacefully side by side. That position geared toward two states is publicly embraced by Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, who reiterated this hope for a peaceful solution on the basis of the two-state solution to the decades-old conflict earlier this week at the UN General Assembly. So even Netanyahu is parroting the position of a two-state solution. However, here's what Giuliani said. It's not in the interest of Israel to have a terrorist state on its border, Giuliani concluded, adding, it would not be the interest of my country to create a new haven for terrorists. Okay, now, think about this just a moment. Giuliani's saying, 
Why? Would you create a terrorist, ter- voluntarily create a terrorist state right on your border? That's insanity, he says. But would it be a Palestinian, would it be a terrorist state? Well, right now, if a terrorist kills Jews, they name a street for him in the territories that Abbas controls in what's called the Palestinian areas. Uh, they give anyone who kills Jews and ends up putting in prison as a result, they put them on a pension. They support their families. They name holidays after them sometimes. So that's the kind of an entity that Israel is presently having to deal with. And that's the reason Giuliani said, are you crazy? Are you going to actually create a two-state solution and turn it over to people who regularly uh, embellish and glorify terrorism? A people who love death more than they love life, who teach their children when they're just one and two years of age, when you get big enough to be a suicide bomber, if you do that for Allah's sake, you go straight to paradise, you enjoy the uh, attentions of 72 dark-eyed virgins. I mean, this is the kind of a situation that is now, this is becoming an issue in the present presidential campaign because when Donald Trump met Benjamin Netanyahu Sunday afternoon, he told him boldly that uh, he is going to move our embassy to Jerusalem and going to recognize Jerusalem as Israel's capital, which the international community does not do, which Barack Obama does not do. And yet here Trump is saying, hey, Jerusalem's always been the capital of Israel. Let's use some common sense here. On the other hand, Hillary Clinton is straddling that fence, and she's still touting the two-state solution. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we'll be taking your calls in the next segment of the program. You've been listening to End of the Age. If you'd like to be a partner with End Time Ministries, give us a call. The number to call, 800-END-TIME, 800-END, T-I-M-E, stay with us. Our brand new series has arrived from here to Armageddon. In this eight lesson series, Irvin Baxter will outline the exciting events recorded in the Bible that tell what will happen between now and the second coming of Jesus Christ. He will explain the prophecies that will lead to the greatest revival the world has ever known and how you can be a part of it. Call 1-800-END-TIME or go to endtime.com to get your copy of From Here to Armageddon. When current events are found in Bible prophecy, it's astonishing. At End Time Ministries, we are seeing them unfold every day, and so can you. We've put together a current events in Bible prophecy package for anyone who wants to understand like never before. Irvin Baxter and his dedicated staff have spent hundreds of hours of research and study, and in doing so have discovered that current events and Bible prophecy are telling the same story. This series includes lessons such as, When Will the Rapture Happen?, Master Plan of the Dragon, Israel's Future According to Bible Prophecy, Signposts of the Second Coming, Refuting Preterism, and To Sabbath or Not to Sabbath. These 13 DVDs will prepare you for this extraordinary time that God has destined you to live. Call 1-800-END-TIME or go to endtime.com and save over 30% when you buy the current events in Bible Prophecy Package. If your radio station only carries the first 30 minutes of End of the Age, go to endtime.com and click the watch button to continue today's broadcast. You can also finish up later by clicking the archives button. You're listening to End of the Age, and don't forget, I will be in Columbus, Indiana this coming Saturday evening, 6 o'clock, speaking on America's God-given destiny, and then Sunday noon, I will be speaking on breaking prophetic fulfillments. What are the big things that are happening prophetically right now? I'll be speaking on that subject, and then throwing it open for question and answers, uh, the location for both of those sessions, The Sanctuary, 3939 Central Avenue, in Columbus, Indiana. Now we're talking today 
about God's covenant with Abraham, which the nations of the world are fighting against, directly opposing God. I'm just going to read it for you one more time. It's only one verse, Genesis 15, 18. In the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. There he defines the promised land. There are several other passages in the Old Testament that define it and even define it more definitively. But nevertheless, that's all we really need to know. It's the promised land. It's the area that today we call the Holy Land. And yet the dispute rages. And the big thing that's caused a lot of articles today is that President Obama in his speech back on Tuesday, a week ago today, at the United Nations, he called Israel's occupation of Palestinian land, when the fact is God said it's Israeli or promised land. And furthermore, it has never been Palestinian land. It's what the Bible calls Judea and Samaria. Yet, President Obama continues to pressure Israel to give it to the Palestinians. The pressure has become so great that the fear of Israel has caused her to embrace the two-state solution. Benjamin Netanyahu, who is is the long-serving Prime Minister of Israel, made a speech at Barland University in 2009 stating that he favored the two-state solution, even though it would mean Israel would be giving up, very painfully, part of her promised land. He openly said that, and then he reaffirmed it in his speech at the United Nations, which happened, I believe, on Wednesday or Thursday of this last week as well. So... Even the prime minister of Israel is taking a wrong stance because God said, when I bring you into the land that I promised to your father Abraham, you are not to sign any treaty or any agreement, sacrifice any of that land. This is a sacred inheritance from me to you, and it is never to be compromised. However, the fear that grips the heart of the people of Israel, it's causing them to compromise even Benjamin Netanyahu is considered a hardliner, a straight a straight shooter. Now, if you'd like to be on the air with me today, the number to call is 877-END-TIME. We have wide open lines, and so uh, it's your time to call 877-END-TIME. That's 877-363-8463. Jim Stiegelman is anchoring our program Back in Plano, Texas, I'm in Indianapolis, Indiana right now where I will be speaking at the Pentecostal Conference here in Indianapolis this week. Great time going on here. Uh, I see the callers are starting to come in. So if you want to get on with us, 877 in time. Uh, Jim, let's go ahead and go right to you. All right, let's start out today in Nevada with Steve. You're first up on End of the Age. Hello. Hello, Steve. Hi. Hey, uh, Irvin, I was hoping you might consider, uh, you know, consider this. Uh, the book of Esther and the book of Ruth, the only two books in the Bible that have women's names. And in the first blood moon and the second, third blood moon, Easter occurred inside of Passover, identifying, the Lord is identifying, that these two faith-based systems are united. Well, when those two resurrection events occur simultaneously, it'll be the resurrection of the body of the body of Christ, and there will be two representatives at the marriage, a Gentile bride from the Gentiles and a Jewish bride from the Jewish. Well, the book of Ruth is the journey of a... Gentile woman to the land, to the promised land, where she encounters Boaz. She gleans in his fields of harvest, and then one day comes where she goes to the feet of her Redeemer, Boaz, lays at his feet in submission and surrender. But before Boaz can marry her, he has to redeem her. That's a picture of the Gentile bride's journey to marriage to the to the Lamb. Now, Esther, Steve, it's a very it's a very interesting analogy that you're making. I like it a lot. 
Uh, are you saying that these particular blood moons are going to occur at a particular time? As a what? Are you saying that these two particular blood moons are going to occur at a specific time? No, the the resurrect the see the resurrection, the fact that the Lord has put the two resurrection events of the of the two faith based systems that that uh, uh, call on Messiah represents that when the resurrection event occurs. These two events, when these two resurrection events occur simultaneously, it will be the resurrection and the rapture of the body of Christ. And that I like, the, I like it a lot, Steve. I really like your analogy. I'm going to look into it deeper because it's a wonderful analogy. I appreciate it very much. I can't keep you on any longer because there's others waiting. But it's a great thought that because there's definitely um, proof in the Bible that the Jewish and the Gentile church will both go up at the time of the second coming of Jesus Christ. So I really like it, Steve. I appreciate it very much. Thanks for the call today. Uh, let's go on now to Joseph from Florida, Jim. Let's go to Joseph. Okay, Joseph, you're on the air. Okay, uh, good afternoon. Um, I was wondering, did you read the article on Debka about Iran signing the naval deal where there are now going to be Iranian naval vessels in Italy and Syria, I mean, to me, that poses a real danger to Israel. Uh, yeah, I did read those articles, Joseph, and I thank you for reminding me about those because they're going to open a naval base now in Syria on the Mediterranean. Of course, Iran has been itching for a base on the Mediterranean, but they're not getting one. They're getting two. They're getting a base in Syria, and then they're also getting a base in the Mediterranean, in Italy. This shows the growing power of Iran, and we are facilitating that growing power by lifting the sanctions off of Iran, uh, giving $150 billion plus other monies that Iran is able to spend in order to expand her power upon uh, the earth and especially in the area around Israel. And the Bible says that both Russia and Iran, as well as Turkey, will invade Israel at Armageddon. So it is certainly an ominous precursor of what the Bible says is yet to come. Yeah, to me, I mean, when I read it, it was like, I almost said to myself, is the devil reading the book, you know, the, uh, the book of Revelations and all the prophecies and saying, all right, I know I'm supposed to do this, and I know I'm supposed to... I mean, it's amazing how these prophecies are coming through every single day I'm like how could, it's unbelievable unbelievable yeah it is so amazing of course that's thrilling to us because that validates the power and authority of scripture the the real truth of the matter is uh, the devil's not doing it because it's written it's written because the devil did it uh, prophecy is history written by one who's already been here uh, God has the ability of seeing the end from the beginning so God foresaw everything, and then he gave us prophecy uh, as he saw fit in order to guide us in our activities as we move through these end times. Great call, Joseph. Appreciate it very much. God bless uh, we thank and be you. well. Hey, thank you. God bless you, Joseph. And Jim, let's go right back to the phones. All right, one eight seven seven end times are on and never. one eight seven seven three six three eight four six three. And Shelby, you're next up. All right, thank you. Hey, hey, Erwin, this is, may God bless you this day, and I just want to let you know, uh, what do you, I just want to ask you, what, how do you think last night's debate ties in with what's going on with what you're discussing? Well, number one, I thought they missed probably the biggest issue. There was no discussion of globalization, of one world government versus retention of national sovereignty. I'm sure that's going to come up in one of the next of the of the next two debates i cannot see how they can avoid that furthermore uh i think time magazine may even force that to the front of the agenda because every u.s senator every u.s congressman the president the vice president trump and clinton are going to receive our magazine this week and it has on the front cover a big gorilla with globalism across the front of its chest and uh, below it written the 800-pound gorilla in the living room. And then I wrote an article on 
globalism and how that is the biggest issue in this political campaign. So it's going to be interesting to see if anything, even maybe from End Time Magazine, will will make its way into the next debate or two. However, uh, there were uh, there were mixed day mixed uh, moments, I think, in the debate. Now, the majority of the polls are saying that Trump won. There's a few polls that are saying that Hillary won. Uh, Drudge says Trump won by 90% to 10%, and CNN, on the other hand, says that uh, Hillary won by a large percentage. But uh, most of the polls that are somewhat neutral are saying that, that Trump won. Now, the, the bottom line is um, there were some issues that Hillary tricked Trump into staying on way too long. Uh, he made excellent points when it came to NAFTA, when it came to the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Uh, he stated that she said it was the golden standard for international trade agreements, and she denied saying that. However, before the end of the debate, uh, the researchers checked it out and played her actually saying that. So she denied saying that, but the fact is she did say that. So he was really strong when it came to these international trade agreements that are absolutely decimating our country and dri driving our national debt up to $200 trillion plus our deficit in trading every year is just absolutely horrendous. So on that score, I think Trump scored really strong in some other, other areas. Uh, Hillary put him on the defensive for a little while. She had her facts mastered, and even some facts that weren't facts she had mastered, and she pushed them hard. Uh, so anyway, it was a very interesting debate. I'm not sure that any, either one scored a knockout punch, uh, but uh, I think both of them probably live to debate another day, which, of course, will happen before very long. Uh, it's going to be very interesting even to see the vice presidents, uh, Tim Kaine and uh, also the vice president to uh, Donald Trump. Uh, it's going to be very interesting to see them debating. I think that happens on the 4th of October. So that's going to be coming at us right away. Um, it's very, it's all very, it's all very interesting. And, uh, and we'll just have to see what God has in mind. You know, and, and as we move forward. Yeah. You know, the biggest thing to me, Shelby is this. Fortunately, we know from the prophecies of the Bible what's going to happen. The United States is not going to be a part of the kingdom of the Antichrist. We know that from Revelation 13. The eagle's wings are not there. We also know the United States is going to defend Israel against the Antichrist. The only question is, how do we get from where we are today to there? Does this mean Trump is going to win this time and pull us back from globalism? Or will Hillary win and then have the war that kills one-third of mankind and then turn America around? I think that's the two scenarios that probably happen. We'll have to see how it all works out. We'll be right back. What an incredibly important subject we have today, Islam in Bible prophecy. It hasn't been many years since those planes flew into the trade towers in New York City, and suddenly the attention of the world was riveted on this religion, Islam, that very few of us knew very much about. But if you had to guess the religion of a suicide bomber, what religion would you guess? Now, could this religion, this huge religion, be totally absent from the prophecies of the Bible? We're going to find out today. It's not true. Islam is in your Bible. To order our DVDs, Islam in Bible Prophecy, and Will Islam Rule the World, call 1-800-END-TIME or go to endtime.com. A DVD that was produced by End Time Ministries is very appropriate for what we've been discussing today. It's called Seeds of Armageddon, September 29, 2012. We're talking today about the two-state solution and how that the nations of the world are pressuring Israel not to claim her inheritance, but to divide her promised land 
and give a large part of it to the Palestinians. And in so doing, in making these compromises, they in fact are sowing the seeds of the Battle of Armageddon. And when I say it was sown on November 29th, uh, let me see, do I have my date right? Uh, November 29th of uh, 1947, uh, first of all, that's when it started. But then on November 29th of 2012, that's when the seeds of Armageddon were sown. And if you'd like to know why I say the seeds for the Battle of Armageddon were sown on November 29th of 2012, get the DVD, Seeds of Armageddon, November 29, 2012. It will interest you and it will help you to see how everything is coming together right now. We do have open lines, and so the number to call to be on the air with Jim and myself is 877-363-8463. That's 877-END-TIME. And, Jim, let's get right back to you. All right, let's go and start this segment out in Texas with Gary. You're next up. Yes, sir, and it's always a pleasure talking with you. And uh, you. my question today is... Um, do you see South Korea in end time prophecy uh, in any manner at all? Uh, uh, Gary, question. not direct, not directly, but I think I do see it indirectly because we have this prophecy of Revelation nine, verse thirteen through twenty one, yeah. that foretells a war that's going to kill one third of the human race. Well, that war starts from the Euphrates River, but it has to expand in order to, to kill 2.4 billion people. That's a lot of people. Secondly, the Bible says an army of 200 million will participate in that war. China is the only nation that I know of that has boasted that they can field 200 million soldiers on the battlefield. So it looks like it's a very, very strong possibility that China will be involved in this war. Now, why would China be involved? Because when war breaks out, especially one that becomes a world war, everyone jumps in to settle their particular pet grievances. Well, China hates Taiwan, and they have announced to the world, we someday will reunite Taiwan with the mainland. We will do it diplomatically if possible if not by force. Well, when this war breaks out, that would make an excellent excuse for China to move against Taiwan. Well, if that happens, that would be an excellent time for North Korea to move against South Korea, which they want to do. They want to reunite the Korean mainland. So the Bible doesn't specifically say that's what's going to happen, but I've thought about it a lot. And if Korea is involved, in an, an unwritten way, that would be the way, in my opinion. By trying to re uh, um, connect the south to the north and make it one Korea. Yes, and they want to do that. Both the south and the north yearns to be one people because they're both Koreans. It's sort of like the division of nor of, of East Germany, West Germany, that mm -hmm. we experienced from uh, 1945 to 1989. Uh, so they do yearn to be back together. However, South Korea wants their form of government to prevail, and North Korea wants their form of government to prevail, and consequently, we continue to have this standoff uh, with the no-man's land in between North and South Korea. Uh, I'm just simply saying uh, that when this nuclear war breaks out in all of its fury, and it will be a nuclear war, you don't kill one-third of mankind without nuclear weapons. Well, North Korea has nuclear weapons right now, and they could certainly use them at that particular time. I'm not teaching emphatically that that is going to happen because the Bible does not say it specifically, but that is a scenario that I have toyed with in my mind. Well, that makes perfect sense. Um, uh, do you have uh, time for, for another comment or question? Yeah, yeah, go right ahead, Gary. Okay. Um, did you happen to see uh, 60 Minutes Sunday night? Where King, uh, I did not. The, okay, the King of Jordan was on there, um, interviewed by CBS uh, Scott Pelley, and uh, and he stated that uh, he that that we are in the Third World War right now, but uh, the West really doesn't realize it. So, anyway, I found that very interesting. That uh, he seemed to to be pretty knowledgeable. Uh, yeah, it is very interesting. Of course, he's right over there in the middle of it because they're right. neighbors to Iraq. 
And it's not the first time that King Abdullah II has made that statement that we're already in World War III, and we may well be. Yeah, it's not the first time he's made that statement. He had done that previously because ISIS is right there almost on their border. And now you've got Iran that is uh, pretty much fighting on the side of Iraq, and they're, they're they're poised to take over Iraq. It's going to almost be like the media Persian Empire has been reborn. If they get this ISIS problem solved, uh, Iran is basically going to be the ruler of Iraq. And they're, both of those powers are right there on the, um, on the border of Jordan. So Jordan is at the mercy of the great powers. They have Saudi Arabia beside them. They have Iraq beside them. Uh, ISIS is in Iraq. They have Syria up to the north. It's in all kinds of turmoil. And then on the other side is Israel. And Israel's the best friend probably that Jordan has, and America is protecting both Israel and Jordan. So uh, it's a very interesting scenario, and the the Bible teaches that Jordan will never fall under the power of the Antichrist. And the Bible also teaches that Israel will never fall under the power of the Antichrist. So that gives us some insight as to what's going on right now. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate your, your time. Okay. Thank you, Gary. God bless you. And Jim, we got time for at least one more. All right, let's go back to Texas. And, Rick, you're next up. Hello, Irvin Baxter? Yes. Hi, Rick. Hi. Um, I uh, I was wondering if you heard of that. This one guy, his name is Mark Taylor. He's a fireman. I don't know where he's from. But uh, he prophesied back in 2011 that that Trump was going to, Donald Trump was going to become president of the United States. Anyway, you know, uh, uh, so uh, when Abraham, uh, you know, you, when World War Three happens, uh, I don't think very many cities in the United States will be destroyed because uh, when Abraham uh, talked to the Lord and his nephew was in a in a bad city, and he told he asked God if there's fifty righteous and forty and thirty and twenty, and finally ended up with ten. If there's ten righteous in a city, you're going to destroy that city. And God said, No, if I find ten righteous, I will not destroy. And there's very many UPCs around where they, there's got to be at least 10 righteous in one, in one church. So, I was uh, yeah, that's, that's, an, that's an interesting way of, okay, thanks a lot, Rick. Uh, that's an interesting way of looking at it. I have heard about the prophecy of Mark Taylor in which he says that God showed him in 2011 that Donald Trump was going to be the president. I don't know what to say about that. Uh, when you have... A prophecy given by someone like this, I think all you can do is wait and see if it comes to pass. And if it comes to pass, it was from God. And if it doesn't come to pass, it was not from God. Uh, I think that's all that we can do with that. But of course, Donald Trump is shocking, not only the United States, but the world. Nobody ever thought he would make it. Uh, When he first started talking about running for the president, uh, Barack Obama just scorned him, made fun of him. Well, nobody's laughing anymore because even before the debate last evening, he is pulling even, if not ahead, in some of the polls. Uh, So it's a very real possibility that he could, in fact, become uh, president of the United States. But this this note that Rick said about uh, that many of the cities will survive because God said he would spare the city if there were 10 righteous interesting possibility Uh, we may find out how many true righteous people are in some of these cities when it's all said and done okay uh jim back to you all right let's go now to renee you're next up on end of the age yes brother baxter i have a question i've heard some people talk about asteroids and fireballs in the sky the sky and do you think that would actually play a part in time when you're talking about a mass number of amount of people being killed Well, there's nothing in the Bible about that. Now, the Bible does say that there will be great hail during the Battle of Armageddon. Uh, The Bible says that that is the uh, seventh vial of wrath that's going to be poured out. The, The one passage says that it will weigh one talent. And according to the tables in the back of the King James Bible, of the Thompson Chain Bible, I should say, Uh, A talent weighs 125 pounds. Now, that's all I can tell you. I do not know what a talent weight actually was back in biblical times. 
But if it mm-hmm. is 125 pounds, you're talking about hailstones that are going to cause a lot of damage uh, when God uses those hailstones against the invading armies that will be coming down against Israel for the battle of Armageddon. That's the way God's going to use it. Then God can certainly do that. Uh, the Bible also says that the stars will fall from heaven uh, and the moon will not give her light. The sun will be darkened. This all happens at the time of the battle of Armageddon uh, in what is called the day of the Lord, the day of God's wrath. Now, the great tribulation is not the day of God's wrath. That's the day of Satan's wrath. Satan's great tribulation will last for three and a half years. But it's an Armageddon when Jesus comes back to fight against the armies of the Antichrist. That's going to be what's called the day of the Lord. And that's when the sun will be dark and the moon will not give her light. The stars will fall from heaven. And certainly it could look like fireballs falling from heaven at that particular time. Uh, Again, we're just simply saying this is what the scriptures say. Well, thank you so much, sir. I very appreciate it, and I appreciate your ministry. Well, thank you, Renee. And... Uh, like one of our callers said earlier on, to see Iran building naval bases in the Mediterranean, especially just north of Israel there in Syria, you just run up the Mediterranean coast and you leave Israel and you go into Syria. And for Iran, which the Bible specifically says is going to be one of the invaders of Israel at the time of the Battle of Armageddon, to see them consolidating their power all the way around Israel. Plus, Iran has at least 10,000 troops in Syria right now. Plus, Iran has many, many more than that in Iraq right now. So, uh, Iran is really surrounding Israel right now. And this is all preparing for the prophecy. If you'd like to read the prophecy for yourself, Ezekiel chapter 38 tells us many of the nations that will come against Israel during the battle of Armageddon, and it's all coming to pass. Russia's going to be there. Iran's going to be there. Iran is referred to as Persia there in the passage. Ethiopia, Libya, uh, Turkey. Turkey is called Togarma in that passage. They're all going to be coming down against Israel at the time of the Battle of Armageddon, and now they're all they're they're making their way there. Turkey just invaded Syria. So now Turkey has troops in Syria. Iran has troops in Syria. Russia has troops in Syria. All that right now. And the Bible says those are three of the those will be the three main nations that will provide the muscle, the military power for the international community to come down against Israel to enforce its will upon Israel at the time of the Battle of Armageddon. It's shocking when we see these things happening. Uh, Don't forget, if you're not yet a partner with End Time Ministries, we need you now more than ever. God needs you now more than ever. Uh, Become a partner with us today. The number to call, 1-800-END-TIME. That's 1-800-363-8463. Oh, by the way, if you're not a subscriber to End Time Magazine, don't miss the new edition. Pick up the phone, subscribe right now. 800-END-TIME and subscribe to End Time Magazine. is a production of End Time Ministries. This broadcast will be available on our website, endtime.com, in the archive section. On our website, you'll also find more information about how current events are fulfilling Bible prophecy. To reach our operators, call 1-800-END-TIME. That's 1-800-363-8463. End Time Ministries is partner-supported. We would like to say thank you to our partners who made this broadcast possible. To do what Matthew 24, 14 said, to reach the world with the gospel of the kingdom.